What day is it? <laughs> Tuesday <laughs> evening <laughs> liturgy <laughs> Luke's gospel characteristics of Luke's Luke's writing salvation history. <laughs> salvation history and a flow of sweep. Now the sweep that comes to Jerusalem. This is where the death occurs, but it doesn't stop the story because then from Jerusalem the whole thing spreads out. Now the church gets started. From Jerusalem we see Paul's missionary journey and it will now spread out to all the nations. So that in Luke's gospel there's always the feeling that well, whatever happened is not the end of the world. Whatever bad thing happens, you can, there's always a chance to start over again because we're part of this big sweep of history that's being run by God. The individual stories have it. Crises come up for individuals in the story, but they're able to overcome them. There's a great ethical sense in Luke's gospel that we have to attend to the ordinary. He doesn't, it's not a sense of getting lifted out and escaping. The real task in Luke is to live every day, day by day to meet the crises and to do it with confidence because God is at work in history and our experience. He will open some new door for us. It's a feeling you get that's not evident in some of the other Gospels. That's why I think Luke's Gospel in some ways is more relevant to us today. It, it was written for people with some of the same problems we've got and I think it, it really does help us uh, to understand that ethical dimension of daily activity, meeting God in the ordinary things of life, something that becomes really important for us. Now Luke is a master storyteller. He wrote a big part of, the, of this uh, material in the New Testament. He wrote a two-volume work, the Gospel according to Luke and the Acts of the Apostles. The same guy wrote them both. And it's all structured on this gospel, brings us to Jerusalem, and brings us finally to the ascension of Jesus, and the ascension then is what frees up the whole activity of the church, which is written about in the Acts of the Apostles. So you've got a very prolific writer, who gives us a big part of the New Testament, is the gospel and the Acts of the Apostles. Inside of that, he's a wonderful storyteller. And one of the things he does is he gives us psychological insight. So we got the steward, the unjust steward, and we get some, what's going on inside of him? He says, hey, what am I going to do? No, I, I can't beg. No, how am I going to, I got it. We see that, we'll see that in the prodigal son story the same way. In other words, he's interested in a mo sort of a modern psychological sense of things. What are people thinking? What are they feeling? And because he does that, there's a great opportunity to identify with different characters in his story. So very often we hear Luke's gospel, the question would be, who do we identify with? What character in the gospel feels like us? And what could we learn from what the overall parable or story has to say? So Luke is a master of telling the stories, and that's why they're classic. So he's given us those great stories like the Good Samaritan that we remember and the Prodigal Son and so on. So that is a, a little bit of background on Luke. Now I say if you come to church during Lent, that's a good thing to know. Because one of the things it does to us, it alerts us to uh, what is going on. It gives us a, a focus point for themes that we can begin to look for when we hear those gospels. Okay, now we're driving ourselves to church. Oh, now we've we got a whole bunch of stuff sort of clear in our mind. Ahead of time, we've read this gospel over. We know something about it. We know the other readings for the Sunday and so on. And so when we get there, we're now ready. But when we get in there, it doesn't always go as well as we would like. Sometimes uh, the whole thing does feel sort of dry and dull and cold and uncomfortable. Now we got another problem on our hands. How do we overcome that? Somehow it's our attitude or perspective we bring to this, that whatever's happening here is bigger than the fact that the usher didn't smile or that I can't stand the opening hymn. And somehow whatever is happening here is more important than these things that go badly. 
In spite of one of my senses, I've been, often been part of liturgies that didn't technically go very well, but where the people supplied, and somehow it went well. Even if the microphone broke or whatever. Earl Luffler and I were at Bowling Green and uh, together for a while, and I often thought that happened down there, where, the, you know, we might have goofed up, but uh, somehow or another that whatever the, the critical mass was in the congregation, they supplied enough to make up for that. I mean, that's an amazing experience. It didn't matter a lot of times about other things, but the critical mass was there. There was a high enough percentage of people who wanted to give something and put into it that it would work anyway. But anyway, we have to, if we come in there, it's not going well, then uh, we have to overcome that. Now, the other thing that goes badly is that we're sitting there and uh, we sit down for the first reading, and somehow we missed it. <laughs> I mean, if someone asked us after the first reading during the song, said, well, I noticed that woman come in late over there with the three kids, uh, especially her sullen sophomore daughter, I saw her. Really. That was clear. You know, I remember that. And then we might even uh, work our way through the second reading without getting it. <laughs> oh, uh, something there happened. Uh, I got distracted with a flag word in the first sentence. It talked about guilt, and I never did hear the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> happens every time I hear that word, guilt. <laughs> Brings back all these images of uh, this uh, teacher I had in the third grade. It's horrible. Gave me a negative sense of Christianity. <laughs> Messed up my psyche. And then that priest yelled at me in confession. That's all, every time I hear the word guilt, that's all I can think about. Well, we can't get by the second reading. But now we do something that is psychologically very wise. We have pre-programmed ourselves to accept certain triggers in the liturgy. That is, triggers that draw me out of my lethargy or my wallowing in guilt or pity or something, and they call me up, and we got one coming now. That is, we're going to stand up for the gospel. <laughs> See, so we stand up for the gospel. That's one of my triggers. I got other ones. The other trigger comes at the end of the Eucharistic prayer when we hold up the host, and then, uh, you know, that when that happens, I, wow, I missed it up to this point, but <laughs> you got to get with it. So we got something in the Mass, we pre-programmed ourselves, it's a trigger. So now the Lord be, Lord be with you, hallelujah, sir. we're standing up and now we're going to lift it. Now we got, we've overcome the crummy opening song. And we've overcome our own uh, fact that we weren't with it during the first two readings, and now we're ready to hear this uh, other reading here. Oh, now we, we're going to try to see how it makes an impact on us. Now we're reading the Gospel according to Luke. It's the 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel. And it's a familiar one. It's one of the great chapters in the whole Gospel and the New Testament. Now, this time, we got a second psychological trick. That is, usually, when the story starts, those of us who've heard it since we were three years old say, oh yeah, I know that one. <laughs> 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 right. I can tune out again. I got <laughs> If they take a quiz at the end of this one, I can answer it anyway. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I know the answers already. <laughs> tune out. But this time, what we've got to train ourselves during Lent is we're not going to tune out, and we're going to try to hear it like adults, and we're going to try to bring to it our own needs and questions and experiences. We're going to actually let it interact with us, with our own sensibilities, our own questions, our own struggles, our own joy. So we're going to hear it in a fresh way. And we're going to remember that because we stood up. Standing up puts me on alert now. Now we're going to listen more carefully. This is it. Right away I see something that I, incident, I mean, I uh, taped radio programs on this this morning, so I sort of have an advantage on this. <laughs> I did it with Ken Mormon and uh, 
tape them during Lent. So as it says on the handout here that if you want to listen to um, comments on these Gospels during Lent, it's on WSBD Sunday night, 10.30 on my Reflections program. So I noticed this morning when I did it, I saw something that I never noticed before, but the reason I caught it was because I had read a commentary ahead of time. It starts out like this. I, 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 I wonder how many people in the room know how the story of the prodigal son starts, what the setting of it is. The scribes and the Pharisees. Hey, how about that? That's right. And not only the scribes and Pharisees, there's other people present. Starts out. This, this is so instructive about the gospel. It's the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around Jesus to hear him. That was his audience, the tax collectors and the sinners. Now, we know the tax collectors were the hated group who were collaborating with the Romans and usually taking something off the top for themselves. Loathsome people. And the sinners are all gathering on Jesus to hear him. At which the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. You know why I noticed that? Because I read a commentary by Fuller who claimed, and I never heard this before, that this parable was told by Jesus to defend his own practice of eating and going to the homes of outcasts. Now, I'm not sure that's right or wrong, but it's the first time I noticed that part of this thing. And it almost sounds like that, doesn't it? These guys are saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And what does Jesus say? Then he addressed this parable to them. You see a certain plausibility in that opinion that Jesus told the story to justify himself somehow to these other people. But of course we know that's not the only thing. The parable is a story. A story functions at different levels. Stories have a way of engaging us, pulling us in touching our interest, helping us to see something we haven't seen before. Andy Greeley wrote an article saying that the whole problem with liturgy is that it doesn't come across as a story. The liturgy is a story. It's a story of God's mercy and love and goodness, and we have to hear that story and let it touch us. So Jesus tells the story. He doesn't say, look, yes, you're right, I go to their house and I do it because of this. He tells a story. A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that is coming to me. So the father divided up the property. Now right there, you get one of the indications that this is truly a story of Jesus. That indeed was the practice of the time. That is, sons did have the right to get the property. The elder son got twice as much. The younger son got the other part. But they had the right to get it. And they could even get it before their father died, interestingly enough. But they couldn't let, like, they couldn't sell it and let somebody else come onto the property and take away, you know, get, take their father out. Couldn't do that. But he, this was legitimate in that sense. So this is part of the realism of the story. So people in the time hearing it say, yeah, that's right, or the kid had the right to do that, but not too wise, not too bright, but he did it. Then what does he do? So the father divided up the property, went along with it. Some days later, this younger son collected all his belongings and went off to a distant land where he squandered his money on dissolute living. Now, where did he get the money? Sold his father's property. Got the property from his father. Then he sold it. Sold it out from underneath his father. Gets the money from it, and now he takes off. goes off to a distant land where he squandered his money on dissolute living. After he spent everything, a great famine broke out in that country, and he was in dire need. So he attached himself to one of the property class of the place, who sent him to his farm to take care of the pigs. Irony, Jewish young man, ex-hatred, different country, what's he got to do? Take care of the pigs. <laughs> I mean, it's a very ironic thing. I mean, hey, Jewish people are not too thrilled. So they, I mean, the story speaks to them way. He longed to fill his belly with the husks that were fodder for the pigs, but no one made a move to give him anything. So 
So he's really down and out now. Now what happened? He's in a mess here. Now the next line says, coming to his senses at last, he said. And now we have uh, part of this inner dialogue. I mean, who is he talking? He's talking to himself, right? Now we recognize all the times we're talking to ourselves. Why did you do that? You should have done this, you know. Well, how do I handle this? Well, I'll tell her. No, that won't work. <laughs> so anyway, so he's talking to himself. I mean, he's thinking, how many hired hands at my father's place have more than enough to eat? Well, here I am starving. His mind's working out. This is not good. I've got to do something. I will break away and return to my father and say to him. Now he even rehearses his speech for his father. Figures it all out, what he's going to tell him. I've got to get off the hook here. I've got to explain this away. I'll tell him what. I mean, I think I'll do it straight out. I'm not going to fudge this thing. Straight out. Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I'm going to admit his guilt. Get it out. I no longer deserve to be called your son. And he's really going to abase himself in this thing. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So we're fine here. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So that's his plan. He's going to go back, see if he can get hired on, then his father's thing, make a little money maybe, win back his father's support, I suppose, after a while. Probably doesn't say that, that's probably part of his thing. With that, he set off for his father's house. Now my favorite part. Well, he was still a long way off. His father caught sight of him and was deeply moved. This is the kid who sold out from underneath him a big portion of his property. Deeply moved. He ran out to meet him, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, he's got his speech rehearsed now. Comes out just like he planned. Father, I've sinned against God and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But he doesn't get out the rest of it about the hired hand because his father stops him. Doesn't get his whole practice speech out at all. The father said to his servants, quick, bring out the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Take the fattest half and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. Because the son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. Then the celebration began. Well, we see, I mean, it's a, again, a beautifully told story. It's what we call a classic story. It has meaning for people of all kinds and ages. You know, you can listen to it now and hear it in a way you never heard it before. <coughs> can say something new depending on our own uh, psychic state at any given moment. It's amazing. The father, the Jewish father, should have been sitting there in his chair waiting for the son to come up and say, hey, look, Dad, uh, I'm sorry, I blew it. And he should have said, well, now look, you've got to prove yourself. You've really messed up your life, man. I'll give you another chance. You've got to prove yourself. All the things we would expect, all the things that would be natural, don't happen, which becomes typical of parables of Jesus. Parables of Jesus are meant to shake up our perception, to say life isn't like you think it is. And God isn't like you think he, she is. He really isn't <laughs> like that at all. No, it's different. It's all different. Get it straight. Don't be so uh, uh, sure that you know all the ways of God. God's ways are not our ways. It's not like you think the guy doesn't sit there. He runs out. A Jewish father gets up and runs out the house to meet his son. I mean, this is different, bad, strange, paradoxical. So, but then, as we well know, the story doesn't end, and we now have an opportunity. We got an opportunity to ask ourselves, you know, when a Luke style says, invites us to identify ourselves with characters in the story. Now we got another shot, a new, a new character appears. Meanwhile, the elder son was out on the land. As he neared the house on his way home, he heard the sound of music and dancing. The party's already started here. <laughs> he called one of the servants and asked him the reason for the dancing and the music. The servant answered, your brother is home, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back in good health. The son grew angry at this and would not go into the party. 
not me, not going in and celebrating. But his father came out and began to plead with him. There's another, you see, the father's character is now consistent. Just like he ran out to see the younger son, now he goes out to plead with the oldest son. A consistency in his approach here. Again, might tell some people about the consistency of God's mercy for all people. He said in reply, Father's pleading with him, come into the party, join the group, and get the family back together there. Said in reply to his father, for years now I've slaved for you. I never disobeyed one of your orders. I mean, this kid is straight and narrow. No, he's right on it. He's not messed up at all. This is your model son. Never once disobeyed one of his father's orders. Incredible. Yet you never gave me so much as a kid goat to celebrate with my friends. Envy, jealousy. I didn't get a party. I didn't get a party like my Then interesting language, when this son of yours returns, <laughs> not my brother, when this son of yours returns after having gone through your property with loose women, interesting thing he picks out that uh, he's upset about and all of this, all this cavorting with loose women, this is really upsetting, you have killed the fatted calf for him. Now, the father comes back at him. And I, what I like about this is the tenderness with which he now deals with the elder son. At least that's how it feels to me. It says, my son, replied the father, you are with me always, and everything I have is yours. Well, we got interesting interaction. It's not like, uh, geez, you know, this is, uh, let me explain this to you. Uh, no, it's got a tenderness to it, doesn't it? You're with me always. Everything I've got is yours. We're in this together. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. We had to, it says. It doesn't say I chose it. We had to celebrate and rejoice. This brother of yours comes back at the elder son. We won't let him get away with this. <laughs> this brother of yours. You can't disown him. You can't let go of that. This brother of yours, his father said, was dead. Lost him. He was dead, gone. And, but he's come back to life. He was lost and his father. Let me take a couple minute uh, break and then we'll see if we have uh, questions. Uh, almost any liturgy is a resistance to a minute of silence. <laughs> you know, as I often say at our place, we'll take one minute. <laughs> now, one minute is not an eternity. But when the sun is shining and you want to get on the golf course, I mean, one minute can seem like a long time. Um, Monica Helwig wrote a, an impressive article saying that her whole bit was that liturgy should be slow-paced and that the whole thing should have a countercultural feel. It's just the opposite of running around. It's just the opposite of busyness. I all these things to do. It's supposed to be that for a period of time doesn't, one doesn't have other things to do. And if it lasts a little longer, so what? You know, that we, that we are not in a frenzy about it. I know in our liturgies there's been times where we've said, now everyone takes their watch off, the celebrant included. Well, about ten times throughout the Mass, I'm like this. <laughs> this is a bad body language. <laughs> And it, it, it represents the problem. So that Monica says that in a culture that is so busy, and you know, every, so everyone's busy. I mean, it, when I go around the country giving talks on the spirituality for busy people, it's one of the most popular lectures I do. <laughs> because everybody's busy. Retired people are busy. They don't know how they used to work. <laughs> oh, it's, it's amazing. So that the liturgy should be countercultural. So we've got this, the Lord be with you, and the, let us pray, and the liturgy says that the presider is supposed to pause at that point. <laughs> now if you do that over six and a half seconds, <laughs> one feels the vibration back, like, what's happening? <laughs> he forgot the prayer. <laughs> 
Guy's mind is going. <laughs> Used to only forget announcements. Now we forget <laughs> So we, if we don't deal well with the silence, now one of the rhythms of liturgy seems to be to be able to do this slower pace thing and to have Sunday be the day of rest and preserve some element of that at least so it's not a factory get in and out. But then while we're there, and again, this is so real, it's supposed to feel different in a way than ordinary life. It's supposed to give us a sense, hey, there's another way to live other than running around in this rat race all the time. There's another way to live. So it's, it's like a message. It's a symbol. The silence is a symbol that this culture we're in is screwed up. That human beings aren't supposed to be, you know, frenzy all the time. Bad for hearts and so on. Doesn't work right. So that it is a countercultural symbol. But again, just like the communist church of the liturgy greedy feast of silence, it is, uh, it's not received yet. It's not received in that deep sense of appropriating it and saying that somehow it makes a difference in the way I live. So we've got to get somehow this uh, other tasting, the ritual as we taste something. Uh, um, as a Lutheran, I sort of wondered, how do you Catholics get people to serve you so clearly? Congregation. I could ask whole ones in the world want the church. They want the children to serve. They want their entertainment. I could hold nine yards there the closing door. I just sit back with this like a theater. You know, go to Bundy Church, the street door, and it's like it's a team court and all that stuff. What do you guys do? Keep this stuff serious. What do you guys do? Keep this stuff serious. <laughs> well, I was, uh, but for the meat triggers, this is a comedy that probably triggers others. I was sitting in the seminary, and I was probably about two years from being in the priest. It was, uh, like I was ordained early young. This was in, uh, 19, I was ordained at 15. <laughs> I'm sitting and walking down to the seminary, and a friend, a very friend of mine, my first, he says, I've got this one. Other books. He says, Powell, Sacrament Sacrifice. He says, All about liturgy. Now, I'm two years being ordained. Liturgy? What are you talking about? <laughs> liturgy. See, in liturgy, that, you know, used to do to read the word out loud. The root of the part that is read in the soul tells you how far to clean. <laughs> And when to buy. <laughs> we used to have sitting, we used to read the rubric, just in six. Now, so he said there's something to the liturgy stuff, and I thought he was crazy. Well, I, you know, really learned about it. I mean, the priest celebrated man many, you know, years away. The Bishop Rare sent me out to uh, Boulder, Colorado. And he said, out there, learn about ten ministry, the concept. Out there, we had liturgy, smaller groups groups a lot, and was, in hard to believe, I said, hundreds of hundreds of matches. It was the first time that I understood myself personally, the part of the liturgy, to put the community, to do something other than have gone through it and finished it, or gotten messy at all. I think time I was there, I understood that the sermon was important, that one ought to say something, if there was a message on it. I don't think that I told that was a very consistent attitude. But as a part of the, the ritual, the symbolic action to, to touch it for level, lying together, I found out that I was bold around. Now, it's a bit of, you know, the Catholic people. Now, there are a lot of Catholic people who still don't know that. They're no fault of their own. That's not any kind of a put down. But they don't know the power of ritual to touch at a deeper level. Some of them are tone deaf. To religious patterns, and they can't help that either. I mean, good book, and go to heaven, and it's wonderful, but in terms of having a feel for religion, they don't have it. They're just not going to do anything. I mean, they might listen to the, the homily, and he said that will hold them at work next day, I'll go with it, but in terms of other things I'm talking about, no, taking the rich seriously. So it's, it's, now what has happened, of course, is through the Second Vatican Council, we got this whole church reform, we got all kind of books. And uh, people started reading them, and, see, and you got liturgy commissions and uh, magazines devoted to it, and a whole sort of industry going to help the Catholic people understand liturgy. And, we, and there are many people who 
about it. One of the things we did that really helped was that whole mass. The whole masses for many people uh, in a small setting were very emotional, very involving, and gave one a sense of how liturgy could function. And so once they got that, they said, oh, well, why couldn't I have this when I go to church? Other people found it in, in gatherings like Tercios or uh, small retreats. Christ the New Church, in different small groupings where masses were very involving and emotional and, uh, and uh, somehow gathered folks together. So many Catholic people have had those kind of small group experiences. So I would say in any congregation that wants to sell liturgy and, you know, and get you know, the, the people involved in it to learn from our experience on that. Part of the experience is a massive effort to educate the clergy and the laity about what liturgy is, and it's not rubric. It's not, um, you know, about rules, how you do things. And I think the Protestant clergy would have to start out with understanding that. And I'm afraid very often that isn't understood, and the language really reveals that often. Liturgy in, in ecumenical circles sometimes means rule, rubric, just like it meant to me when I was in the seminary. So that Protestant really would have to move beyond that. <coughs> then you'd need a lot of small group experiences, it seems to me, that are really good liturgy. And then you'd have to try to somehow get that critical mass that I was talking about that is so hard to attain in the average parish. So hard. I mean, we've worked so hard on this. And, and you can look around how many parishes where I think that actually happened. It's not a large percentage in the Catholic world, I don't think. But that's what it's in your own congregation, excuse me, that's what you'd have to get to. A critical sense, a certain percentage of the people who know what's going on have an expectation because they've experienced it once before, this could be good when I go there. This could move me, touch me, illumine my life, help me understand what's going on. <coughs> help me to get in touch with the wellsprings of power inside myself or help criticize me for my uh, failings and so on, for being like the elder brother, or for the, the, the younger brother. Well, there's a thing to be saying uh, that the size makes a difference. Does it really? In other words, can other things have an intimacy about them in large well, I don't know if they can have intimacy, but they can be powerfully effective. And all you have to do is look at some of the great papal masses with uh, thousands, maybe a hundred thousand people present that are very moving and powerful experiences for people. Let, let's stop, step back, and ask ourselves, what is it that liturgy is supposed to be doing? Uh, what is it that's supposed to be happening? Well, one of the prime things is that we're supposed to be worshiping God. That's why we've gathered there, to worship God, to thank God, to beseech God, and also to gather ourselves together so that we can reinforce our own values and so we can strengthen ourselves to go out from there to live the message in the world. Now, those things can happen without having a sense of intimacy with everyone else there. Now, in a small setting, when a family's together and they're having a mass, and someone's sick in the family, and they're present, and we're all praying for them, I mean, this is emotionally involving. You can't be there without really getting into it. But you can have effective liturgy, if, you're at, if you know what you're asking. You can't have warm intimacy with a thousand people in the big church. You can't know everybody there face to face. You can't have a community. But that doesn't mean you don't, can't have good liturgy. You've got to get back, ask yourself, what is the nature of liturgy? What is it we're trying to do? It's our public worship of God. It's our gathering for fellowship. And it's strengthening ourselves to be able to go out and witness to the truth of what we find out there and learn there and know again there in the world. That means working for peace and justice. That means trying to be socially responsible. That means trying to be personally helpful to other people. So I would say liturgy can be very effective that way. It doesn't have to have that special warmth or intimacy. I go back to what Abraham Maslow said about peak experiences. He might have overplayed it, and not every liturgy is supposed to be a peak experience, nor can it be. Not every liturgy can just be great, emotionally involving. It's impossible. But we can have a lot of what he called plateau experiences of liturgy. That is, you go there and you remember, remember something about life, you remember something important, 
one of the ways of thinking of liturgy is that it's where we keep alive the memory of Jesus. What I would say that my beginning comments were about that symbols have a power to transmit culture, to transmit meaning, and so on. One of the things that our Eucharist does, our sacramental system, is keep alive the memory of Jesus. Who he was, what he was about, what he taught, what wisdom he gave us, and so on. And that we can do. And I, so I'm, I'm off on that word remembrance right now. There's an anamnesis is the word we use technically. It is a recalling of what Jesus was like. It's a recalling a memory of his death and resurrection. But it's a special type of recalling that makes it present. We recall it in such a way that it's present for us now and can speak to us now. So it's not just a proclamation of what God did a long time ago. It's like Christ is present now in our midst just as he promised. The remembering the memory of Jesus is, uh, is uh, real. The presence is real in the assembly, in the word, in the Eucharist that we share. One author likes to talk about the dangerous memory of Jesus is what we keep alive. Because that memory can haunt us too. It can challenge us. It can keep us. It can keep us on our toes. It's like uh, reading the elders here to keep us on our toes more so. Not a solution. I just read recently episode four for a talking. It was talking much about parents and children. Here's the number of indigenous children. Didn't understand. Oh, is a soul goodness. I think so. What I need to know. I left out, and I, I'm glad for the question and comment, just to sprinkle a little bit. It, there, it really is a great responsibility on the part of the leaders in the community, the surgical leaders, to make that operation to be able to sign off of it. The liturgy is great being a sign. That's a sacrament, or sign that affects the signal. But in order to do this, and this is what we're in the second message, you see, the old idea was it went to man. It didn't matter if it's a certain crummy or each set of ass or the people doing it didn't matter because you got great. You beg at all days to go to three masses real fast because you got more grace than yourself and the soul. Yeah, so that was true. You got more grace by being. And it's the time value of something that the client is very clear in himself. That it, so the recovery of the setting council is no, that's not right. The sign has to be good. The better the sign is, the better the sin is celebrated, the like, better it's prepared, transmitted, then the more grace is given. In that sense, that is, will make people more receptive. Grace can do it only to the degree we're receptive. It's like the air we breathe. You know, it come in to the degree that our lung power allows us in. We need to be open to that. So the sign has to go up, and there has efforts to make it. And now it brings you back to the question, well, how do you do that? How do you accomplish that? Now, we have a lot of things that we know of. They, they know that it works if a, if a warm atmosphere is created. And there's the people who greet people, and the actions of the celebrant, the presider, I should say, before Mass has an effect on that. They know, I mean, this is from uh, research, uh, the, the Notre Dame study I'm drawing on uh, shows a lot of the things that they parish it, that the liturgy is, is presented well, what they do. One of the things that, that they do is that they often practice a song before Mass. No, and no one's exactly sure why that seems to help, but it, it, it is a factor in successful parishes. Also, the fact the warmth of the greeting that the celebrant offers to the gathered people is important. Obviously, a very large factor and a growing factor among Catholics is the quality of the homily. Now, for years, as we know, the Catholic people put up with lousy homilies. Their Lutheran pastors could have never gotten away with them. You know, I mean, and, and, and there was not much time put for preparing. And it was just, uh, who cared? I, I told a story many times, and I might as well tell it once more. They say you keep, John Shea told me, he says, you keep telling these stories so you get them right. <laughs> I told this about a hundred times. I used to say mass in different churches in the New York area. And I would go around, and one of the things, I mean, I had this great sense of that people did not pay attention to homilies. I mean, they came there, they didn't 
care. They, you know, and they, they never heard anything before, and they didn't expect to hear anything. And I, would, I used to go and stand in the pulpit based on this theory and just stand there after the gospel. <laughs> <laughs> you know how long it is to stand 20 seconds in? I mean, how long it is. But a classic case, never forget, I'm standing there, and they always tell how long it's been since people ever heard anything in church, you know. <laughs> but this guy sitting in front, older gentleman with his wife, I finished the God settles down like he's done for 67 years or whatever. Sits down and he goes down like this. <laughs> <laughs> I said, put better prepared, fall asleep. <laughs> so, at the 10 second mark of my silence, I'm seeing him. His hand goes, his wife's in there, it goes like <laughs> <laughs> Something's not happening here. <laughs> Something interrupting my sleep. <laughs> I have the background voice. <laughs> and it's a full two seconds for his eyes come to me. You know, now my is, the guy hadn't heard anything in church for years, and he wasn't expecting hear anything that day. So I just sort of looked down and said, well, yes, I have something to say. <laughs> I always have something to say. So we do, we've got to do a better job of the preaching. Um, I happen to be writing a book with Bob and Mary Jo's son, Kevin, right now on preaching and uh, on how to improve preaching. He's uh, preparing a statistical survey to find out how, one, how preachers are prepared in seminaries, and then also asking the questions about how people respond to sermons in, in, around in, in various churches and so on. To, to find out what works and what doesn't work in an empirical way. Very, I think it's a very, very valuable study. And uh, we're going to put this together in the book on preaching to try to help the uh, preachers to do a better job. But we really have to improve on that. Um, and so the, 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 the readers, the, the quality of the person who reads the scriptures is very important. Being well prepared, being able to get the meaning across. Trying to create a climate for the greeting of peace is important. Trying to uh, create a whole life. What Andy Greeley found out in his studies is that what is crucial to all this is the climate. It doesn't matter so much if the priest in the, in the homily, the presider says, gets the words all right, or, or even um, whether you know, it's sort of doctrinally correct or not, what is important is whether there are warm and comforting images of God, Christ, Mary, and the afterlife that are, that are given to the congregation. That, again, just highlights the idea that the sermon, the homily, is part of the symbolic action. It functions at a deeper level than just the words. All preachers know that because sometimes after we give a homily, someone will come up and say, you know, you made it, the point you said about this or that really helped me, and it's not a point that you made at all or intended to make. It's a rel relatively common experience. And uh, what it means is that something else is happening than intended words. And according to linguistic theory, communication theory, that's not surprising, but it does happen in, in this uh, kind of setting. So we've got to improve in all those ways. That means you've got to plan. You know, one of the things...